So I've been asked to talk about demand and engagement on uh, Shelter's social media channels. We're a big fan of Orlo. It's really helped us in what we've done. Um, I've already had the intro, but I just wanted to have that picture in there. Um, <laughs> I'm on the left. <laughs> so if we're talking about engagement, why is it an issue if we've got lots of engagement? Well, the problem that we've had is the sheer volume. So the large number of comments. And this is a scary image that was greeting us pretty much every morning of seeing huge amount of comments. Every day we tend to get in the high hundreds in terms of comments. Sometimes it can be in the thousands. Most of this is coming from our paid advertising and this is through Facebook. So they're coming through um, and not necessarily to our organic audiences. So we're reaching out to essentially to cold audiences, people who don't necessarily know about the work that Shelter does. So we tend to talk about helping to end the housing emergency and people might be at different points of their journey of understanding what the housing emergency is. So what that means is a lot of the engagement that we get is often to do with confused, they're confused about why we're using a certain stat, they might be skeptical towards that or they might not just believe what we're talking about because we might not be able to have all that information in just one singular Facebook post. So it ultimately means a lot of questions that we get from the audience. Also, it's only going up. So this isn't something that's going to maintain at the same level, it's only going to get more and more. So what we were doing before, which wasn't really sustainable, was working over weekends to try and make things more manageable for the Monday because we used to log on on the Monday and there's far too much stuff for us to do, which meant we couldn't actually produce the content and everyone's so stressed. And we used to get lots of really pinch points. We have a big Christmas campaign, for example, so we have certain points in the year where all we're doing is just responding to comments and we're not able to proactively put out that content. Also, we're quite a small team. We don't have a customer service element, um, which means that we're content creators, but we're also community managers. So if, for example, someone was on leave or someone was unwell, then we reduce the capacity a huge amount and that resource drops. Also something that we found within this huge volume of comments is a lot around anti-immigration. Now the slide there, um, that's when we got, so 312 messages on Monday, December the 19th, just about immigration, negative comments on one day. And so we have these spikes and they're usually from the fact that we're reaching out to cold audiences. And going back to the well-being that Kirsty was talking about before, these comments, they're automatically hidden through all the filters that we have, but the social media team still sees all of these. I'm talking about triggering comments and stuff. Some of them, you know, really not, not nice comments that you want to read and it's the volume of them that builds up over time. It's also a big barrier to support. People aren't willing to support the policy actions and things that we're calling for because they're fixated on issues like this in their mind. So why it's a problem, all that huge amount of engagement that's quite negative is the organic community that you've built up over years that really value your work and support your work, they feel left out. You're not engaging them as much because you're essentially dealing with some of the more high profile stuff that's quite negative. Also, I've mentioned it before, but as a social media team of content creators, we're spending a lot of time doing community management and we're not there to actually make that type of content that we want to. And I think importantly, supporters and particularly advice seekers, so we run a lot of services um, through our charity, they're put off asking questions, they're put off involving themselves in conversations because it can be quite a toxic atmosphere. If they can see all this negative comments, they perhaps don't feel that they can get involved. So some of the ways that we've streamlined this process Now that's a, a long list there, but this is uh, using the trigger function within Orlo. So all of these words, these are set up during the um, automatic triggers 
and this automatically, if someone uses these phrases, um, indicates them as a potential service user. So we can prioritize those comments. And we make use of tags on Orlo so much because that's what we need for this data. So we can showcase to the rest of the organization, these are the issues that we need to work on. We're getting a lot of comments on this particular issue and we can use that as a reporting tool. Also, we're able to use um, internal experts. So we're able to use users within Orlo and assign comments to them. Perhaps we want, we've got a question on community fundraising. They have a seat on Orlo that we can assign their message to, which means as a social team, we don't have to be that middleman as much. Also, this is something that we're increasingly trying to do, but it's quite difficult, is we run a lot of big paid campaigns that might have a, a reasonable budget, but there's no budget for community management in that. They're just solely for actually the delivery of the adverts. But this affects my team a huge amount in organic social. So we're trying to work with teams, and they are receptive to it, about building in ban um, ma uh, community ban uh, budget for the, all these paid campaigns. And finally, it's all to do with data. You need to have this data. Unfortunately, telling people internally that you're really busy just doesn't work. Um, everyone's busy, but if you've got the data to actually prove it, that's what makes senior people listen. That's what makes senior people actually put the budget for that. So something that we do to chase good content, as it were, is um, prioritize things that we know really work for our audience. So quick form video, reels, TikToks, we love stuff like that. And also we're able to, even as a charity, use humor and sarcasm in a lot of what we do. You know, if we're reaching younger audiences, we need that because we're competing against a lot of other organizations in that space. Also, we're very topical. So we need to be able to react to things in minutes and hours, not days and weeks, which can be really difficult. And also to show emotion. Sometimes that works really well for us. So we can show outrage when we're angry at the government for doing something or usually not doing something. We can show that outrage or we can really be really positive and reinforce good behavior. And also when we're using case studies, it's important to sort of tell that in detail and give that a true story because sometimes when those stories are doctored, people can read through that and you need that authenticity on social media. And particularly if people are unsympathetic towards people's plight, they will ask for information. Why didn't this person do this? Um, and that's really important for us from a community management point of view, because we're able to safeguard that case study and present their story in a way that makes sense. So some of the other ways that we might do this is actually go actively hunting for good engagement. So I use it as a spec savers approach, which you may have seen, which is a, um, a lookalike of um, Prince Harry that is uh, slightly um, dubious there. Um, and it's about trying to insert yourself into conversations like this. Um, they might not always work, and particularly for certain organizations that might not be useful, but these are the things that get huge amounts of engagement on social media. And the way we've done that, we actually build that into our process. I know it's a kind of like planning to be spontaneous, but you have to do that because everyone's so busy all the time, you need to put that time into your calendar to actually look for these opportunities. You can do that through social listening, or you can just do that through checking through your own timelines. And this is really important to have that trust in the social media team. Otherwise, if you're just going through layers and layers of sign off, you'll miss that topical moment. So you need to have that um, expertise within the team and the trust internally for the team to be able to do that. And this comes back to the entertainment aspect of engagement. So um, I put on, on air here, and this is the example we've got here. Sometimes when we talk about how expensive renting is and people with, um, you know, really clever responses, buy a home. And our, our response to that is, um, oh, thanks, you know, thanks very much for that really informed opinion there. Um, now, the important thing to do there is you have to choose your targets when you do something like this. Sometimes you might want to 
to use it anonymously because you don't want to actually make people dogpile onto that particular person. But it's important that you're, you know, you're there and you're actually engaging with people and you're calling out when things <laughs> aren't very helpful to that community. And also using your community to create content. What are they talking about? What are they asking about? What can you then wrap up and use and make that into content? How can you reflect that back to the community? Because they'll engage more of it that way. And finally, just reinforce that good behavior. If you see people acting in a really positive way, how can you elevate that? How can you show that to everyone else? Um, and this all feeds into that welcoming and inclusive community. And that's really important, that word of inclusivity. Um, so many communities feel cut off for certain groups. And we're trying to do that at Shelter where everyone's welcome. And other ways that you can live your values, um, particularly as a charity, this is really important to us. This is one of our key reasons why people support us, because they believe in our values. I put this here, don't be afraid to say bye. Um, an example here is uh, someone commenting, we were taking on a legal case to support Afghan refugees. And this is our response. And solidarity with the RNLI here, who have gone through, you know, absolutely a huge amount of abuse for their stance, where essentially they've, you know, they've doubled down on their position. They're there to help people. And so are we. And I think it's really important that, you know, you're seen to your supporters to live those values in what you do. Also, it's so cathartic to block people. We love blocking people now. Um, we used to be quite scared that essentially you are blocking off an avenue for people to, if they need help from us, they might not be able to get it. But there's other ways they can get help. They can get help through the website but it's just not worth it sometimes. You're not gonna win everyone over. I think it's really important to have community guidelines and they're not an internal thing, they're an external thing. People need to know how, you know, what, what are the standards within this community? What, what are you allowed to say? How are you allowed to say it? And it's not, it's not censorship. It's just making, this is how this uh, community works and what we will and won't stand for. And yeah, just be unapologetic about it. You know, this, this is who you are, this is your values, and it's really important that it's public. And be authentic in what you say as well. You know, bring that personal experience in if you need to. And like ways that we would do that from a sort of campaigning perspective in the content we do, to give it a bit of perspective there, yeah, we received, um, almost 10,000 comments on immigration last year, you know, and that's gone up from the previous year. So this is increasing and increasing and we'll, we're not really talking about it. So, you know, we, we started this campaign, which essentially is um, social housing, not scapegoating. So sort of putting, putting the blame, the fact that we're not building enough social housing as the issue here, as opposed to people seeking safety in this country. Um, but you'll see there, we've also turned off the comments. And that's a mental health well-being thing for the social team. You know, we're not there to fight fires on this. You know, what we want to do there is make our statement completely clear and then be like, OK, you know, that's, that's what we believe. And it performed really well, as you can see there. And yeah, we largely hide and delete these comments. We don't get involved with them. And so essentially people are shouting into the void when they're doing this. And it's one thing for a social media team to do this. We, we're behind a screen. We have that degree of separation. But the people who work in our frontline services and the people who work within communities, they also, they also you know, have this kind of negativity sometimes around it. And so that's why it's really important for us to reflect this back online so they don't feel isolated as well. And yeah, just the comment about turning off comments is such a useful tool. And so ways you can achieve that, and I think it's really important to invest in community management, is the fact that community management, it does need a unique set of skills. So passion is really important, passion and alignment with the cause for a charity community management. Um, empathy, precision in what you say, 
but also that thick skin. You need to be able to separate yourself from it and compartmentalize at times. And that's why, yeah, linking moderators to the cause, and you can see an example there, um, the fact that, you know, people think that Shelter are continuing our work because we want to justify our jobs and salaries. We make it very clear that we want to go out of business. That's our aim. We want to cease to exist. Um, not everyone believes us, but we, you know, that's why we put those messages out there. And yeah, to be human, to be kind, and to tailor those answers. We have FAQs, but we change them, we tailor them so people get a bespoke answer. So you're not essentially getting that same response every time. And so some general recommendations off the back of that. Um, FAQs, they're so important. And I seem to spend most of my life chasing teams for an FAQ. They might launch a new campaign and we won't know about it, and people have questions all the time. And it's really important as a social media team, community management, we feel empowered to be able to respond to people. Essentially, otherwise what we do is we then speak to other teams and we work as a, a middleman. And it just slows the process and gives a really negative experience for people um, who are trying to seek the answers. Also, if you've got a pot of money to boost your best performing organic content, that's really important. It doesn't always have to be paid campaigns. Um, if something is performing really well organically, if you're able to put just a small amount of money behind it, it can make it really effective. And also, again, this is to do with paid advertising. It doesn't always need to be focused on extracting something from an audience. We try and do some brand advertising that isn't actually asking people to sign a petition, to give us money, to do this, to do that. It's just reasserting our values, what we stand for, and why you should support Shelter as a whole. And tied into that is to bring organic social closer to paid social, because your audience will not see a distinction there. It's the same, you're speaking as Shelter in both occasions, and so if there is very different copy approaches, for example, or content approaches, that will be a bit of a jarring user journey when they do see your paid adverts and then they start to follow you on organic, but this isn't the same place that I followed. And something that we're trying to do is a bit of a less reliance on agencies to run some of these campaigns and bring things in-house. There's a huge amount of expertise within every organisation and no one knows the brand and the values better than the people who work there. And finally, the slide to the right here is a good example of this, is explainer content. This is our bread and butter at Shelter. We spend pretty much every day making one or two of these things, which is the fact that don't presume knowledge. Don't presume that your audience knows all these basic things just because they might be on your website. Um, people come at it at different points, people are very busy as well, so you always need to be reasserting some of those more commonplace things and explainer content is just so effective for that. And that's it, thank you. Thanks, Spike. That's, that's wonderful, thank you. Um, any questions for anyone for Spike? More great. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much. That was really, really interesting. Um, I just wanted to know a bit more about your social media team. So like, how big is the team? And then also like, how would you say you um, split your time between like production, planning, like evaluating, community management, you know, is it, could it be, could it be better? Or could there be more kind of? We have a team of four. I'm trying to grow that. It's, um, so to put that in perspective, I guess our total followers across just our national channels are just under half a million. Um, and for a team of four, that's quite, quite a lot for us to do. In terms of how we split our content, we have a dedicated community manager and then have a, a social media manager and a social media officer whose remit is content creation mainly, although everyone gets involved in community management because it's such a beast. We need everyone to kind of get involved with that. Um, 
something that we have to deal with quite a lot is reactive work. So we can plan to a degree, but um, within our team, we've all been burnt by the fact we've planned the campaign even just two weeks in advance, and then we've had to scrap it. So whatever the, we do have to kind of dance to the beat of the government's drum sometimes, and some parliamentary process and announcements. So we need to be ready to be reactive. So I don't know as a percentage, but yeah, reactive work would probably be about 20 to 30% of what we do. Uh, community management about the same, and then content creation kind of in between that as well. So uh, I was interested in what you were saying about um, with comments and hiding and deleting comments especially because I think in a, in a housing association you would get a lot of sort of just people who are generally not necessarily needing like a, a specific sort of answer but more just to complain, maybe troll on the pages. Um, so I want to know like was it a difficult decision to come to deciding to hide and delete comments because we had a lot of back and forth whether we should hide them or actually face them sort of head on. Um, but it's interesting to see that you, you take a decision to like hide and, and delete and also respond to comments that may sort of be a bit, you know, maybe tone deaf a bit um, against the values or, um, you know, you may have a response where it's sort of a silly comment that someone's made. So, yeah, was it a difficult decision to, 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 to do that or do you sort of see how you go with it? Well, we're, we're tagged into a lot of housing association stuff at Shelter anyway, so we see all of this. Um, I don't think it was necessarily a difficult decision. I think for us, it was about intention of the commenter. What are they trying to do? If it's in good faith, if they're just angry about something we've done, you know, we make mistakes, everyone makes mistakes. So I think we need to front up to that. But it's when they're doing it deliberately to set an agenda when it's an ideological argument or something, you can't win against that. And also, something that we weigh up, if we're putting a campaign out there and all the comments are on something completely different that they're trying to move away, that campaign is failing. So we need to sort of steer that ship back to where it is. So I think intention is really important about where they're coming from. We often get what I'd call bad actors so people will say something, you know, with a kind of a mask on, but you know what they're getting at. You know, we get a lot of dog whistle sort of stuff as well. You know, people saying one thing when they mean the other. Um, and the way that you would make those calls it is expertise and experience. You know, you need to have been in that sphere of community management for quite a long time to recognise that. Also, using the tools at Orlo, we have a note function on there, so people you know, who've commented to us previously, we might say, you know, be careful with this, there's, there's a history here. Something that we found actually really effective is someone would comment and then you'd look up their profile on Orlo, they'd have said the same comment 48 times or something. We would respond saying, uh, you know, hello so-and-so, this is obviously uh, something that you're, you're really passionate about because it's the 48th time you've asked us this. Um, and that tends to stop those kind of things. So not being afraid to kind of reference that kind of thing um, because essentially, yeah, they're not doing it because they've got a real gripe. They're doing it because they want to have a go at us about this or they want to make a particular point, whether that's political or whatever it is. Hello. Um, I just, I, I really like the examples that you gave for your sort of more like sarcastic replies. Um, I work for the NHS, so there, there's a lot of times that we sort of get comments that I feel I would like to reply in more of that kind of way, but it's something that I don't think we'd get away with. Have you always been able to sort of go ahead and do that? Or has it been a process of kind of getting people on board to allow you to be a bit more I guess, humorous with your comments in replying to like negative stuff? Yeah, it's a fair question. Um, I would say, okay, number one, that's not how we reply all the time. Yeah, we, we are very, um, you know, because we have people coming to us at, you know, various, various points, you know, people who are raising money for us and it's all very positive. And then we have people who are feeling, you know, absolutely at their wits end because, you know, they're going to be made homeless. So obviously it's contextual where we reply. Um, I would say 
there's a sliding scale of where I would say like senior people's eyes are on stuff. So Twitter is a very public medium. You know, we could say pretty much anything on TikTok because they don't follow us on TikTok. And that was part of the reason why we did it. Um, we just set it up and kind of went with it. Um, and now over time they've realized, oh, it's successful. Oh, can this team do this? Can this team do that? Um, so I think it, it does relate to which channels are more public than others, particularly on Twitter. You know, if you, you see it all the time, I don't know, say a train company or something says something that's slightly insensitive and that reply gets blown up to be, you know, something bigger than it is. So we do always check if we are going to do one of those Saki replies, we would look at that profile. We would make sure that that, you know, is a response that can go out. You know, we obviously would never do that if someone was in a very difficult situation. And so we have to be very careful with that. But again, yeah, that just comes from experience and just having the tools available so you can check those things. In terms of how we've managed to do that over time internally, um, proof of concept. Do it and show it and then beg for forgiveness afterwards, to be honest. And yeah, just make it into a slideshow like that and show them that then they'll, because trying to say this conceptually to someone who might not use social media that much, they say, that sounds risky. Don't want to do that. But actually show it, show the fact you get good engagement and then you're on to a winner. Thank you. Thank you, Spike. That was great. Thank you.